Hello? Hello? हेलो यस हेलो हेलो हाँ गुड इवनिंग सर सर आई एम स्पीकिंग सुजाता मैम रेसिडेंट सर हेलो 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 यस 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 Yeah. Okay. Are you able to hear clearly? Hello. Uh, hello. थोड़ा थोड़ा voice थोड़ा voice crack हो रहा है. Hello. Now it's clear. Ah. Uh, एक एक मिनट. हेलो गुड इवनिंग क्लियर है हेलो गुड इवनिंग सर हेलो माइक नहीं वो पीपीटी हम शेयर करेंगे या वो उधर से शेयर होगा सुप्रा सुप्रा इधर आओ इसको कैसे करना है नहीं नहीं ये सिर्फ पीपीटी करना है ना ये वाला थोड़ी वो एंटर करना है यहाँ पे शेयर शेयर सिस्टम ऑडियो आएगा ना ब्राउज में ओपन किया मैंने नहीं नहीं वो सीधा अरे जीमेल से ओपन करो ना मेरे पास ईमेल नहीं है ना 
हमारे मुख ईमेल खोलो मैं मेल करता हूँ हेलो आई एम ऑडिबल ना गुड इवनिंग सर या योर ऑडिबल थैंक यू टू ऑफ मैम्स कनेक्शन आर
uh, I am sharing the screen. Can you see it? Yes, sir. We are able to see it. Uh, the slides are uh, uh, changing, na? Right? Yeah, yeah. The slides are moving. Do you have a video or anything? Uh, no, video is not there. Just uh, pictures and uh, this one. Yeah, Let's... this this is all right. This is all right and clear. Oh, yeah. okay.
Better we'll start sharp at the seven o'clock only. Yes, sir. We'll we'll start around seven o'clock then. Okay. Yeah. Sure, sir. Sure. Okay. Dr. Arun, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Good evening, everybody, and welcome yeah. to the Smart Residence Learning Program, which is being conducted by the USA and the ISU. Today, we have with us Dr. Sujata Patwardhan, who is the head of the department at the KM Hospital, Mumbai, and uh, she has authored the book on genital urinary tuberculosis. She would be speaking on her favorite topic of urinary tuberculosis, which is very important for all the residents because you will have 
a case if there's a case available it will be a long case for you in the exams and you need to know about urinary tuberculosis because you will frequently encounter patients with urinary tuberculosis with this brief introduction i would now request dr arun chawla chairman of the indian school of urology to introduce dr sujatha and then moderate this session over to you dr arun uh, thank you dr kishor so it's indeed a great privilege to introduce in today's faculty dr sujatha padwarkan uh, she is currently working as professor in head department of urology at k m hospital gs medical college mumbai a medical teacher for the last 23 years and mentor to more than 50 students till date she is also a zona transplant coordinator for state of maharashtra uh, she has many honors to his credit establishment of organ transplant center at kem in 2017 formation of guidance for the transplant and she has received the, the best state rotor sort award three times since 2018 for her best performance not only that uh, she has established a, a cadaver lab and tissue lab in kem hospital uh, mumbai and uh, 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 those who are not aware uh, she has conducted many uh, uh, program related to organ harvesting and transplant uh, on the cadavers uh, in this lab uh she has done numerous training workshop in pcnl vvf ecospedias and uh, the organ retrieval techniques and uh, many awards were awarded like uh, she has swithri uh, bai phule award for manish shakti 2011 bmc award for best faculty and bmc award for best female doctor in 2019 uh as dr keshav was mentioning she is author and co-author as well as contributed to many books and um, as an author she has uh, scripted a book on renal uh, hyperplasia prostate on urinary tube process informative case and contributed to the pa textbook of surgery and manual for transplant coordination she is very active involved in uh, uh, cadaver and tissue lab at kem hospital and we will be seeing this uh, when we have on 28 to one cadaver uh, workshop hands on workshop um, in the same institute uh, with her um, on 28th of august and uh, she has been pivotal in training guidelines for our various tissue uterus and hygiene complex and uh, instrumental in making transplant history uh, with dhs maharashtra uh, along with that there is key research she is uh, doing a lot of collaborative work with usi on um, uh, bhp um, she has held many organizational positions as a secretary of zonal transplant committee maharashtra as a nmc inspector as a member of academic committee and chairman of committee for fellowship in reconstructive urology slavers and for maharashtra university of health sciences and she has more than more than 75 national publication a, a very very keen uh, and passionate teacher and is uh, if you if you encounter the students who have uh you know, pass and the they are very fond of her because of a, a very keen involvement with the, the students teaching uh, we are very lucky to have her here for a very important subject for student active process on the topic which she has already scripted one book uh this topic is as application was mentioning uh, not only important uh, but it covers uh, so many things not only the microbiology the pathology uh the uh, radiology the urology and the reconstructive surgery and other issues so a lot of subjects are involved in this and she has made her presentation in a way that will be very very uh, easy and comfortable for you keeping in view that this disease can present as a different different form uh, upper tract lower tract combination with no radiology with radiology with the, uh, some issue related to lab findings so she will be sorting out all the issues and she will be providing answers to all your doubts too. and you will be much wiser after the class with this i invite uh, dr swatha padwagan and uh, madam over to you thank you very much sir and uh, dr arun chawla and dr keshav for inviting me and uh, making me a part of this uh, teaching program and i'm very happy to speak on this so today we have uh, selected about 9 cases but as many as possible only those will be completed uh, here in
this format we won't go much into the uh, history in detail because uh, that i think uh, we have covered in the past though uh, 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 so the history will be presented to you entirely and then we will discuss on management and investigations so that and uh, please feel free to let me know in the chat or uh, you can raise your hand and we can uh, discuss any points at the end of the case or at the end of the session whichever is fine so we'll start with the first case over to you please first case sir. yeah yeah just a minute huh? yeah so we have a 19 year old uh, female who presented with history of open pyelolithotomy done uh, 12 years back that is when she was seven years old and uh, twice excision of the sinus was done and uh, though the histopathology was uh, tuberculous granulation tissue and she re received AKT, yet the sinus recurred. So, uh, sir, you were going to delegate uh, two, two students for each case? Yes, ma'am. That... Actually, you, you, Ms., um, I have put in the chat box, but for the time being, I am giving you two students. Uh, one minute, ma'am. I have got a message also. One is Dr. Sachin. And uh, other one, I'll take one minute. Ma'am, just let me see who is there. Uh, I'll take uh, Dr. Suraj. Uh, Suraj and Sachin, please uh, unmute yourself. And uh, we'll go ahead with uh, Madam's case. And probably please feel free to, feel free to answer uh, and interact with Madam. Yeah. So, uh, Sachin, uh, Sachin uh, please uh, identify Sachin, yourself. Yes, Sachin, can you hear us? Okay, Suraj, are you there? I can see him, but he is not unmuted. Yeah, they have, uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Sachin is here. Such okay. Suraj, Sachin, are you there? So, Sachin, I have a question for you. So, the diagnosis here is clear that the patient uh, had uh, a sinus excision for the first time. Diagnosis was tuberculosis, and why did it recur on the second occasion? Why uh, do you think it uh, recurred? One is because of maybe resistance, ma'am. One may be tubercular resistance, ma'am. Second, still after AKT treatment, the patient uh, still tubercular dormant may be, basically may be remain after completing okay. AKT also. Okay, and what else are, are causes for a sinus to persist? Uh, one uh, is epithelialization, sinus. Complete, ma'am. Pardon? Uh, her uh, treatment, which she has told she might have not uh, taken it uh, completely, ma'am. Uh, her history, we have to okay. evaluate so, that. Yeah. Treatment so, the, uh -huh. treatment so we'll, uh, we'll try and cover as many cases. So, I'll tell you the answers. You are right for both the answers that her treatment may be incomplete or she must have not received the proper treatment. She could have develop resistance and hence she is not responding to the uh, cat one akt but the main reason for a sinus to recur is either obstruction or persistence of the disease so the disease was persisting in the kidney in some form either because of inadequate treatment or uh, whatever and hence uh, the sinus was recurring so i hope that part is clear we'll go on to the next slide Why is it not moving? Okay, so this is the picture of the sinus which is present in the flank incision. Hope you can see it. So coming to investigations, like uh, though the urine AFP was done, it was negative. Now I would like to tell you uh, one uh, point which is commonly asked in exams about urine AFP smear. Okay, so this is the most fast and the most reliable technique of a diagnosis of a urine AFP in the um, or diagnosis of tuberculosis but the problems with this test is collection of the urine proper sending it to the lab secondly you know it's a passive bacillary disease and thirdly uh, you may not you require uh, at least uh, 10,000 bacteria for it to be present and uh, to be uh, detected so these are all the problems in addition smegmatis and other uh, 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 bacteria may be misdiagnosed as tuberculosis. 
plus it you cannot make out between dead and live bacillus so uh, you should know the uh, drawbacks of urine afb but yet it is a very uh, it is a very rapid test because the test if it is done it will be available in one day's time uh, so i hope i am clear on this uh, aspect so this is a sinogram uh, which was done so apart from sinogram sachin uh, what investigation do you think would you advise uh, ma'am i so want to know ivp ma'am i contrast uh, ivp yes ma'am yes okay. ma'am ivp or ct ivp ct urogram yeah now uh, you choose one whichever one you want i want to ct ma'am ct urogram if creatinine were normal i will go for the ct urogram okay creatinine is normal but why did you choose the ct urogram one ma'am i will get to know the detail about the renal condition how is the renal parenchyma la renal architecture and sinus tract length and also sinus tract length already got and i'll know the ureter where is the stricture length of the stricture i can yeah but same things I... can be done on an ivp normal ivp so why don't you want a normal ivp ma'am with ct uh, the extra uh, renal anatomical information i'll get ma'am like if there is a chronic abscess along with it uh, next to the kidney and uh, if there are uh, uh, yeah any mass lesion or any localized collection or yeah. any peri uh, peri ureter collection yeah. so or so you are right collection. that a ct iv ivu has an advantage over a conventional ivu because uh, the disease may not be limited to the kidney and may be in the perirenal or may be in the But, adjacent uh, spine or in the uh, going to the soas or uh, and we would know the extent of the disease but the most important answer expected like the first answer is in an ivp suppose there is a non functioning kidney it would not be you will not be able to visualize anything on that side right that side yes, would be like you can you don't know anything about that kidney while on a ct even if it is non functioning you would have some information about that kidney yeah okay yes. so this is the uh, advantage of a ct scan uh, plus the advantages which you told are also right can you just in 2 minutes describe this uh, sinogram uh uh ma'am in this sinogram uh, we can see a, a a sinus tract which is leading into the uh, uh, probably area of the uh, renal pelvis on the right side with uh, the spine being uh, uh, there is some amount of scoliosis probably uh, because uh, of the chronic inflammation and also a probable uh, psoas abscess which has irritated the psoas muscle uh, that is why she is Okay. Holding it that way. Oh, yeah. Any other finding, uh, which is uh, if you see carefully. So yeah. So you, if you see carefully, you can. Urine is not draining uh, below the level of uh, yeah. L four. Probably okay. there is a stricture at L four, ma'am. You're yeah, in the ureter. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So the sinus is either communicating with the ureter or with the renal pelvis. We are not very clear. but you can yes. see calcification that is the point you missed if you see carefully you can see that the calyces are outlined and there is some amount of uh, calcification which is speckled in the upper pole and lower pole so we'll go to a ct scan which will show us that parenchymal calcification is seen can you see this yes yes ma'am okay you are appreciating this you can appreciate yes. that the opposite kidney yeah. is totally normal there is no perirenal yeah. involvement there is calc calcification and obviously the sinus tract is not visualized because ideally you should have done the sinogram with the ct scan CTU. that would have yes. given you more yeah but it is not very difficult to uh, know the anatomy of a sinus tract intraoperatively okay so uh, uh, i hope you appreciated the ct scan that it was a non functioning kidney smaller in size opposite side is showing compensatory hypertrophy and normal uh, calcial uh, uh, anatomy and no no evidence however we do not know about the left ureter and the bladder so the report is saying that it is normal and uh, 
here they have mentioned that the psoas muscle is bulky, but it's not very uh, clear on the CT scan. So what would be the treatment for this? Uh, Ma'am, for this, uh, we'll go for the, if kidney is non-functioning and calcified and fistulous tract, I will go for the right side nephrectomy. Only nephrectomy? Yeah, with the ureter, so with, with the ureter, possible. With? Maximum length so of see, ureter. Uh, so, uh, Sachin and uh, Suraj, both of you, uh, I would like uh, I would like to point out that give a complete answer in exams. Okay. So, you'll have to remove the fistula and fistula the tract. kidney and the it's ureter, right? Ureter. Because yes. if you leave back the fistula tract, we do not know. Both the times it was showing tuberculosis. So, it may have tuberculosis, right? And a calcified yes, kidney also may be a focus of tuberculosis in how many percent? Around 40 percent, ma'am. Around about 16 to 20 percent. But yeah, it is a, a, some amount of bacilli could be dormant there. So whatever is the diseased uh, tissues, you should remove along with the diseased kidney and the ureter. So uh, in, okay, so underwent nephrectomy and sinus tract excision. Now, in this patient, I would like to bring your notice to this part of the history. That patient received AKT twice. So, for first time, obviously, she must have received category 1. So, for the second time, which sort of AKT will you give? Uh, she, she'll have a, a longer course of uh, treatment, ma'am. Uh, considering uh, which, which AKT category one or the let's say uh, uh, rifampicin, INH, and uh... Uh, along with this, we'll add streptomycin ma with INH and rifampicin. Okay, so both of you are uh, partly wrong. Is uh, whenever the patient receives category one and she develops. Uh, persistence of the disease for the next time, ideally you should send the tissue for culture. Now whatever tuberculous tissue which was excised should have gone for CPNAT and should have gone for culture. And there we would have found out whether she has rifampicin and INH resistance. And uh, in case we do not have a tissue for because somebody may have referred it to you or you may have forgotten to do or you may not send the sample properly in saline or it may not reach the laboratory properly. So if all these things are factors, then you have to repeat category 1 AKT. And on the second occasion, and it is given again for only 6 months, and on the second occasion, if she has persistence of disease again, then you have, and you cannot start uh, MDR uh, uh, treatment, or you cannot add streptomycin or any other drug, unless there is a diagnosis of uh, or a uh, diagnosis of resistance on microbiological tests. So that uh, these two points, please keep in mind. In this case, these are the take-home points. Okay. So okay. Uh, we'll go on to the uh, second case. So if nobody is there, we can uh, continue with you, sir, or uh, somebody is there to volunteer. Yeah, ma'am, let them continue. Then we'll change after that, after this case. Yeah, so this is just showing the uh, kidney cut surface. And this is the cut surface where can you can see that the kidney is very small and the fat around it is thickened and you can see areas of caseation and calcification. I hope you can see the slides. Yes, yes, ma'am. So now we come to the second case. This is a 22-year-old male who presented with bilateral flank pain and he also had lower urinary tract symptoms of frequency and urgency. He had constitutional symptoms also. So now the history is very easy for you. Like diagnosis is already told to you that he had pulmonary tuberculosis six months ago and he has started with CAT1 AKT. So when a patient of pulmonary tuberculosis within six months of diagnosis starts with symptoms related to kidney or any other extra Extra pulmonary organ. It is called extra pulmonary organ, right? Kidney is an extra yeah. pulmonary yes. tuberculosis. Yes. So one question is, which is the most common extra pulmonary organ which is involved in tuberculosis? Lymph nodes, ma'am. Lymph node is first, second is lymph GOD. Nodes? Yeah, so your answer is right. Lymph nodes followed by genitourinary system. Yes. And then, then which one is common? 
Plura, ma'am. Uh, skeletal, ma'am. Skeletal spine. Okay. So now this tuberculosis of we assume that because he has this all constitutional symptoms and we are talking about genital urinary tuberculosis. So we assume that this patient had GU tuberculosis also. So why did he have it within six months of uh, pulmonary tuberculosis and while he is on AKT? Uh, uh, one is again compliance, ma'am. Whether he is in compliance with the drugs, he is taking proper drugs. Second, again, the resistant, either it may be resistant, drug resistant tuberculosis. Yeah, but usually we always say na, that uh, this is a reactivation of the disease, of the, uh, it is not a direct infection. Well, Pardon? And one more, whether he is immunocompromised, whether he is immunocompromised. Okay. This way, okay, immunocompromised. Any other reason? High bacterial load, ma'am. One more thing. Can okay. be high bacterial, high bacterial load. load. Any other reason? Uh, it could be uh, the presentation of a miliary tuberculosis, ma'am. Uh, right. The so, it bleeding. could be miliary tuberculosis, right? Right. So, miliary tuberculosis with uh, which is secondary to hematogenous spread and he could have both the organs involved simultaneously at the same time. Okay, so three, four reasons you know now. So ultrasound showed that on the there is a multilobulated cystic lesion noted on the, I think it is the left side. So it was diagnosed as a complex cyst of infective etiology on the left side. So, obviously, uh, investigation of choice would be? CT, CT Euro. Okay, so just for uh, completion, so that you can see maximum number of cases, we are going ahead with the CT. So, here, here in this patient, like who has a focal lesion on in the kidney in one pole only, the... the the detection of tuberculosis bacilli on urine AFB is likely to be very low because low. so which is the best method here when you're now we know that the patient is on AKT pulmonary tuberculosis we are suspecting tuberculosis of the kidney so which would be the best sample here for microbiology uh, if it drain if the abscess cavity will drain abscess the and, uh, after, abscess drain it, drainage of the abscess huh? Or if any sample yes. tissue will get so, we can uh, what test will you do on this sample uh, on that uh, sample uh, we'll be looking for uh, afb uh, bacilli as well as uh, culture okay so, and so that is afb Gen smear afb culture and gene expert gene expert, gene expert. Mm -hmm. okay uh, will you do gene expert in the urine uh, no, Gene expert RIS can be done, ma'am, uh, on urine also. Mm -hmm. So, yes, according to the guidelines which are set by Government of India, uh, CPNAT or the test, it's a gene expert test which is available at the RNTCPs or the government centers free of cost. CPNAT is not advocated on free voided sample of urine. If it is a collected sample from the PC system, either by ureteric catheterization or by aspiration of the PC system directly by a needle or any abscess cavity or anything, then it is advocated. But on a free voided sample, CPNAT on a urine test, on a blood test and a feces test is not advocated. It is, it is I think, a policy which is take, It is done in, in terms of um, cost cutting, and also related to the yield of the bacilli because uh, uh, in our country, you know that we uh, account for almost uh, one fifth of the total cases in the world and our uh, number of cases are to the tune of 1.2 to 1.5 million per year. Okay, so aspiration of the sample from this would be uh, uh, best for urine AFB, for culture and uh, for CPNS. So CT, uh, it is, this is the report. What else would you like to know? Are you happy with this report or you want something more? So 
so obviously we have to uh, uh, he has lower urinary tract symptoms ma'am so i would yeah. like to evaluate for his lower urinary tract symptoms as well yeah uh, initially so we need a imaging of, of his, his lower urinary tract yes yes, yes not necessarily cystoscopy first of all you should know imaging because we can see the ureter we can see the bladder we can see the opposite kidney first you see it on imaging and uh, cystoscopy has very uh, limited role in tuberculosis especially if the it make it can be done and it may uh, help you in diagnosis provided the capacity is normal but ideally never do a cystoscopy in a small bladder or a thimble bladder because you are likely to perforate okay so whenever somebody asks you that uh, will you do a cystoscopy always think is this bladder of adequate capacity that my scope has place to go inside without perforating without causing damage and is there hematuria ongoing because in this situations uh, you would not get the information which you wanted to know and it would have a very limited uh, and there are better test mention about the bladder okay so here uh, what would be the treatment which we can offer to this patient apart from mkt we have done the uh, we assume that we cpnat is not showing a rifampicin and inh resistance so the same akt can be continued continued for 6 months uh -huh. and this lesion has persisted after 6 months what will you do i will uh -huh. A drainage yes. of the drainage of the cystic lesion, ma'am. With if you drain it and it is showing tuberculosis, it will come in the perirenal space. Will it be possible to drain the upper pole of the kidney directly outside oh. the abdomen? Then you'll find the form of sinus. Yes, sinus. What was told in fundibular stenosis and calyx? Yes, ma'am. Then so, yeah, we'll you'll put the piece in. Okay, put a PCN. It doesn't stop yes, draining. Then every day there is thirty forty mL of some turbulent fluid coming out. Then so intrarenal surgery in tuberculosis is pretty difficult. The results are very uh, not promising in the sense like they don't behave as uh, you expect them to behave. so if this was only a normal abscess without evidence of tuberculosis then you could have dilated the infundibulum or you could have incised the infundibulum and kept the stent uh, properly in the upper calyx and uh, done this but usually in tuberculosis these me measures don't work there are operations which are uh, reported as cavernotomy where as you said it the abscess cavity is excised and it is allowed to heal but uh, at least i have not seen this surgery being done so uh, don't know whether you would also see it but uh, here your answer could be a polar nephrectomy okay. or a partial nephrectomy okay so if the okay. uh, abscess cavity persists in spite of pcn in spite of akt and the patient has uh, pain and all these uh, things then you can go ahead for a polar nephrectomy or a partial nephrectomy the uh, chawla sir so should we i'm going to the case number 3 what should be done about sachin and uh, suraj uh, uh, okay um, i'll just see uh, is uh, gurwansh are you there in the chat has anybody uh, written anything yeah, no no nobody here. Aznur, Aznur, are you there? Okay, ma'am. We'll take them for the next case. We'll continue with them both of them. Okay. Yeah. So yes. So we are coming to case number. Yes, sir. Doctor Guruvan, she is here. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I am there. Okay. And uh, Aznur, Aznur, are you there? Okay, ma'am. We'll take uh, Guruvansh along with both of them. Okay. Okay. So we are adding Guruvansh. Guruvansh. Okay. 
so gurumesh now all the questions will be for you to a 48 year old male presented with poor stream of urine straining flank pain constitutional symptoms and uh, examination findings are normal except mild tenderness in the left flank creat is 3.2 Yes, ma'am. Hmm. So here I am not uh, trying to, uh, from history, to come to a diagnosis of tuberculosis. We are dealing with all cases of genital urinary tuberculosis. So Hb is low, creatinine is high. Patient has constitutional symptoms again in favor of CRF. and he has lower tract symptoms of obstruction and left flank pain so what are the possibilities which could be happening in this patient uh, ma'am since he is having poor stream also along with straining to micturition so high chances are there that he is also developing the urethral stricture tubercular urethral stricture okay one poss one possibility is there ma'am and then uh, Mm -hmm. there might be ureteric strictures leading to left side uh, uh, poor drainage and compromise of the renal function okay so in uh, in the lower urinary tract uh, obstruction uh, when we are combining these two situations like tuberculosis and obstructive symptoms which is the most common organ do you think is involved uh ma'am after kidney ma'am नहीं नहीं सी पेशेंट हैज लोअर ट्रैक्ट यूरिनरी ऑब्स्ट्रक्टिव सिम्टम्स राइट सो इट इज इधर रिलेटेड टू द लोअर ट्रैक्ट यस मैम सो इफ दिस पेशेंट आई टेल यू इज अ नोन केस ऑफ जेनेटिव यूरिनरी ट्यूबरक्लोसिस व्हिच इज द ऑर्गन मोस्ट लाइकली टू बी इन्वॉल्व मैम एपिडर्मिस इज द सेकंड मोस्ट कॉमन ऑर्गन सी एपिडर्मिस वोंट कॉज सिम्टम्स ऑफ स्ट्रेनिंग ड्यूरिंग मिक्चुरेशन एंड पोअर स्ट्रीम ना यस मैम सो द मैम The, when you say it's the urethra so obviously i am yeah. not happy so, with that answer uh, yes other other two prostate prostate prostate, 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 prostate yeah prostate. so the prostate is also very commonly involved in tuberculosis and whenever the lower tract is there it is most commonly involved organ if the if it is a known case of tuberculosis urethra also can be involved so uh, bo both the answers are right but most commonly the prostate followed by urethra are common organs wapis ye ja nahi raha okay so on ultrasonography there is bilateral hydronephrosis and hydroureter till vuj so this is the dru where it shows your diagnosis is right so what are the radiological features of tuberculous prostate so there is obviously a stricture in the posterior urethra membranous urethra is not well visualized posterior urethra is also not, were not very well visualized yes ma'am hmm. on ma'am uh, on we might note calcifications in the prostate ma'am yes more than that has anybody seen a case of tuberculous prostatitis No, we might no, uh, have a scrotum sinus at the posterior side of the scrotum ma'am no, no. no we are talking of prostate radiological features of tuberculosis of the prostate are the prostatic urethra is dilated there is usually ex intravasation or extravasation of the contrast into the prostatic ducts may, all the prostatic ducts may be filled with this contrast so it, it looks like as if it is a flower okay so that's okay. the most common uh, feature seen on uh, on radiology plus there may be evidence of uh, involvement yes. of the bladder neck and the bladder so uh, as we sus suspected so we did put a pcn on the left side because he had flank pain and all and uh, here uh, we'll just show you other investigations but this is a pcnogram we are going ahead we'll come to this case this uh, x ray again pcn fluid was sent for evaluation and was positive for tb uh, on pcr it was started on akt1 this is the 
CT scan. So I'll just run through the pictures of CT scan, then one of you can describe. So you have had enough time to see. So one of you describe. On right side, kidney appears to be shrunken with the loss of parenchyma and calcification of the lower pole. Yeah. There appears uh, left side uh, parenchyma is preserved with the mild hydrotonephrosis and mm -hmm. bladder appears to be thickened with small capacity, hmm. reduced capacity and... Uh, One more thing I expect you to notice. Yeah. What is the rounded structure there? Limb. This Limb. Huh? Ureter, ma'am. Ureter, dilated ureter. Yeah, so because uh, you have seen, uh, you have seen the PCNogram yes, previously. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. The seen the PCNogram. Is, yes, ma'am. There appears you to be a distal see that, that ureter is, yeah, so that ureter is dilated and thickened right down. So now we yes. have a case where there is involvement of the kidney, there is involvement of the ureter, there is involvement of the bladder, and there is involvement of the urethra. Yes. And opposite side kidney is, right kidney is, Non-functioning with 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 calcified. Yeah. Okay. So now tell. So like this patient has everything apart from his epididym is and vas being involved and the prostate being involved. Only three organs are not involved. So what will you do? We assume we are giving AKT and everything. All that is done. Now, surgery. Yes. Uh, well, now, since his uh, urethra is also involved and the capacity of the bladder is also not good and creatinine is also rising, so the best option for him can be man, the uh, right side nephrectomy along with the ileal conduit. Okay. What about the bladder? You keep it or you remo uh, remove it? Mm. I'm better to remove it okay. to remove the focus for the tuberculosis. Any other opinion? Uh, once the urinary diversion is done, uh, there is no, uh, no much importance uh, with removal of the bladder, ma'am. Because you cannot remove the entire segment anyways because the urethra is still persistent. So, uh, cystectomy is not required, ma'am. Uh, just a diversion with a short ileal conduit itself. Yeah, so, yeah, I tend to accept uh, your uh, answer because uh, cystectomy in a tuberculous bladder, it may be very difficult. It can be, uh, you may not be able to remove the bladder very easily. Uh, secondly, uh, the complication which happens because of keeping the bladder back is pyocystis or persistence of disease. So that is very infrequently seen and however if it happens, you may have to go ahead. So uh, uh, you can, uh, your answer was right in the way that you can do a right nephroureterectomy, a uh, left uh, the left ureter can be put into a short ileal conduit because the creatinine is on the higher side. And the bladder and the urethra can be left. And if there is a problem, you, will, you would keep a watch on these two complications and you would go ahead and tackle them in the future. So this is an option. After completion of AKT, we can do that. But uh, we did something else. So, patient was offered permanent perineal urethrostomy, augmentation cysto, augmentation ileocystoplasty, right nephrectomy, and left ureteric reimplant. 
so what would be the problems related to this operation ma'am uh, with this operation the, the reason being uh, on ct uh, the bladder looks very thickened and small so uh, the other thing would be ma'am uh, uh, like uh, we have I mean I have no idea exactly what was the bladder capacity prior to the surgery uh, so it is 75 cc yes ma'am then uh, the other thing would be like he has a ureteric stricture so that is so very implanted na so very yes. implanted the stricture we augmented the bladder patient is a, a young patient he doesn't want a stoma uh, so what can be the complications of this operation Ma'am, further urethral get urethral like perineal urethral stenosis can go for the perineal okay. urethral. Yeah, that is one. Are you bothered about it much? We can tell the patient to do Perine. daily calibration, daily dilatation. What is the major complication of this surgery? Uh, one is because of his creatinine. Ma'am, is high creatinine level. So, so metabolic problem. Yeah. If he if he is non-compliant, ma'am, with the emptying of the that augmented bladder, then it will further lead to the deterioration of the kidney function. Mm hmm. Okay. So one is deterioration of kidney function. What else before that happens? What are the deterioration of kidney function will happen maybe after six months or something? As you said, if he is careless. if he doesn't do csic or what overnight drainage so in such a patient who has compromised renal function and you decide to augment the bladder you have to keep in mind that metabolic complications of this bowel are much more than what you would do in a normal patient so you would have metabolic acidosis you can have uh you can have hematuria related to it you can have bone disease related to it so all these complications are highlighted in a patient with tuberculosis and compromised renal function above 2 mg uh, per deciliter and if the patient is non compliant with doing csic and overnight drainage so you have to say that overnight drainage is compulsory in this patients so that the at least that much time the urine is not in contact with uh, is not is not less likely to be absorbed and it can reduce the uh, complications related to urinary absorption so metabolic complications and deterioration of renal function these are two important things then maybe you are right that there could be stenosis of the uh, perineal urethrostomy so i think it is uh, 843 we may be able to complete one or two cases more 32 year old patient presented with flank pain uh he had geo tuberculosis is already on akt then somebody has attempted rgp and stenting then they removed the stent then uh, put a pcn so obviously everything is happening on the left side so this could be a case of obstruction of the left kidney left. okay i am directly going to show you the ct scan okay see this films the film on the extreme right this film please describe ma'am there is a asymmetrical focal calicial dilatation noted on the left side okay. with the uh, uh, right side kidney appears to be normal ma'am no, no, preserved... let describe uh, the left with uh, with uh, With infundibular stenosis, ma'am. Uh, That we can't see, na. Yes, ma'am. On yes. The excretory film. This is a plain uh, film, right? Yes, yes ma'am. Bladder appears to be okay. Well uh, see, see the contrast film. See the contrast film also. Then you can comment. Okay. Now this one. Yeah. Ah, uh, ah. Hey, uh. Pelvis is high club pelvis, ma'am. Yeah, high intrarenal yeah. pelvis, ma'am. Intrarenal pelvis. 
So this is one of the most important feature for diagnosis of renal tuberculosis is a symmetrical dilatation of the calysis, which could either represent cortical abscesses or <coughs> the destruction of the calyx itself okay. due to infundibular stenosis. And it is of varying grades and it is having varying amount of parenchyma covering them. So that is a feature followed by a small contracted pelvis, a hiked up pelvis, which could or could not be having POJ obstruction along with thickening on the pelvis. So these are the features. And I think you should read the article by Suleiman Merchant on CT, IVU, and now MRI also, I think he has written uh, in GU tuberculosis. Okay. So uh, about this patient, this is his PCNogram. You can see that he hardly has a pelvis. Can you see? It is an intrarenal pelvis. There is hardly any uh, volume to that pelvis. But the function is good. What will you do? So here we have a, a narrow pelvis, narrow pelvis, intrarenal pelvis. We have a ureter which is uh, not very good beyond the middle third. Yes. We have dilated calyces which are unequal, having uh, uh, and one more feature. Can you tell me what what is seen on this PCNogram? Uh, up, uh, upper calyx are there. Infinite, they are yes. not taking so the that. upper calyx is not visualized. This could be due to infundibular stenosis. Yeah, it could be due to a very small pelvis, which itself is very cicatrized, or it could be due to infundibular stenosis. So now tell us the management. Uh, um, uh, yeah. uh, because the ureter is also unhealthy, but the renal system is functional, ma'am. And lower pole yeah. seems to be healthy. Uh, the option would be to create a, a ileal ureter uh, from the lower pole extending to the bladder, ma'am. Okay. Well, option Very number concerned. one. Option number two. See, uh, when the pelvis is so uh, intra, so much intrarenal and hardly having any volume to it, it looks at itself. It looks like an arrow ureter. So there is no yeah. question of reconstruction of this pelvis. There are three problems in this patient. There is uh, upper tract is not communicating with the pelvis. Neither is it communicating with the lower calycial system. So there are two different systems inside this kidney. So if at all you have to address and you have to do an ileal ureter, you have to address this problem of infundibular stenosis of the upper calyx, okay, which is very difficult. Doing any intrarenal surgery and trying to bring about some anastomosis between the upper calyx and the lower calyx is difficult. Secondly, he has a lower ureteric structure, so he has obstruction at the upper and the lower level. So you will have to decide which one to deal with first you'll have to divert urine for the time being give some time and then look at the lower ureter and what to do with it this is one option or the other option is an ileal ureter that is possible okay but such kidneys don't do very great with uh, surgery and most of them would end up in nephrectomy okay. even though they have a good function because the surgery doesn't work the ureterocalicostomy doesn't work. The ileal ureter doesn't work. All the problems are related to technical uh, issues and tuberculosis. So now uh, I think, uh, do we have time to go ahead, sir? Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead, ma'am. We have a okay. couple, uh, couple of cases we can cover. Okay, so total time is still another half an hour, right? is it? Yeah, ma'am, till uh, we have 7.45. Till 8 o'clock will run, and then we'll see what are they in the chat box. Okay, okay. So I think we have 13 minutes to go. So this is a 38-year-old man. Anybody else is joining, or we continue with Suraj, Sachin, and... Uh... Yeah, we'll continue with them. We'll continue. Okay. okay. 
Okay, yeah. So, 38 year old male presents with bilateral flank pain. So, we are trying to give you all the scenarios which are happening. Till now, we were dealing with unilateral disease. Now, uh, this case is about bilateral flank pain. And obviously, he is a patient of GU tuberculosis. He uh, has history of AKI where uh, his creatinine went up to 3.6 and then he came uh, nadir creatinine after diversion. Bilateral PCN insertion which was done, uh, nadir creatinine has come to 1.4. He's a known case of disseminated cox with pot spine and on category 1 AKT. Patient had underwent bilateral PCN. Is a known case of epilepsy on treatment. So creatinine is 3.6, but you can take it as 1.5 right now. And HB is low. Okay, so we'll go directly to the CT scan. See this, uh, this thing, I'm going to ask you to describe it. So this is a non contrast CT. Okay, CPCNogram also. We'll directly go to management of this patient. So it's nadir creatinine is uh, almost 1.5. Okay, we consider this at normal. And there is bilateral involvement of the kidneys with, uh, you could see. Dilated and, uh, hydrocalicosis. Yeah. Hydrocalicosis. Yeah, hydrocalicosis. On the oh, left side, you can see that the pelvis is intrarenal and it is very small and yes. thickened. And on on the right side, it is partly extrarenal and uh, there is some narrowing Nar which is persistently narrowing. seen at the PUJ. PUJ. With, kink uh, with kinking and yeah. multiple site narrowing. Yeah. And the uh, left ureter is not seen beyond the upper third and the right ureter beyond the middle third. Right. Uh, and bladder you saw, no? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Bladder looks okay. Bladder looks bladder okay. Looks huh. sure. okay. Huh. So now tell us the management. In this case, ma'am, we'll go for the scopy plus RCP if possible to know the lower ureter either side or side. What do you think would be happening to the lower ureter? Stricture, ma'am. Yeah. So? But we'll know the length, how much the length you can assess the length of the okay. stricture. Yeah. Okay, we so could not negotiate upon. both the ureteric orifices. RGP was not possible. Okay. There is a cutoff. Cut so the lower ureter is useless on both the sides. We assume that it is useless. Now tell me the treatment. Uh, dive. Um, I just had a doubt. Should we do a, a, a DTPA scan so that we just to get to know the split GFR of both the kidneys at this stage, ma'am, okay. uh, before we uh, yeah. plan on an intervention? Because the left kidney looks uh, 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 like more lost of a function. So uh, implant trying to implant it uh, would be a more uh, difficult issue than to... Uh, Remove it. Okay. Uh, okay if both of the them are equally functional. If both the kidneys are equally functional, uh, 
then uh, the other option would be to take a small length of ureter uh, i mean uh, ileum and uh, implant it in between the bladder and uh, the ureters being implanted to it like a uh, tower shaped ureter or a rat tail uh, ureteric uh, implantation okay uh, what else so it's called a rat tail anastoma sir yes and the yes, right the bladder is quite uh, large but we do not know what are, what are the problems occurring in the rest of the ureter because it is showing various areas of narrowing kinking so we actually do not know whether this ureter can be utilized uh, means can be kept in the patient and we expect that it would uh, remain normal without any strictures and obstruction so this uh, these two things uh, you need to talk about because both the systems have some evidence that there is narrowing at the puj so whether we would be able to utilize these ureters will be seen only once we open and we find out what's happening right yeah. so uh, yes, you, and the possibility has to be mentioned by you in an exam that the ureter is dilated thick and narrowed at various places kinked so uh, if it is okay on exploration then uh, i can go ahead with rectal anastomosis and you take uh, about a one end on the dome of the bladder the other end you anastomose both the ureters suppose this ureter is useless up to the puj then ileal ureter can make the complete ileal ileal ureter ileal ureter ileal ureter ileal ureter ileal transplant bilateral ileal ureter Yeah. Uh, but uh, that would uh, uh, worsen his renal functions again. But yeah, uh, it will worsen his renal function because he is tipping. Now you do not know yes, this one point five is a reserve which uh, may go up any point in time. Now creatinine may go up any point in time. So bilateral ileal ureters will be another twenty five centimeters of ureter on both the sides. Yeah. Uh, fairly morbid operation what else can you think of out of the box which can be done for this patient right side right only right side ileal ureter i will consider ma'am ureter in the left side i will assess the function mhm mm here we are saying that the ureter is useless na up to the, only the pelvis is okay and then auto transplantation ma'am if we can do on the on the on the right on side ma'am the pelvis we can directly anastomose to the bladder but again there is dissection will be very difficult in uh, okay uh, because of uh, extensive okay. fibers suppose are the dissection the, of the pelvis on both the sides is easy any other option you can think of <clears throat> not given in your textbook so you will have to use your imagination trans uh, One uh, uh, transuretral ureterostomy, but transuretral yeah, uh, ureterostomy. We are saying the ureters are not good. Only pelvis yeah. is there on both the sides, which is accessible. Uh, can we bring uh, bring out a ileal uh, conduit which is anastomosed yeah. to the uh, pelvis? Yeah. So it is possible to bring an ileal conduit. With one opening of the pel left pelvis on uh, on the conduit, followed with the right pelvis on the conduit, and bring the conduit outside. Okay. Only issue is, uh, whenever we bring That's the left, uh, when whenever we are doing a normal ileal conduit, we bring the ureter from the mesentery from the left to the right. But when we are operating in the upper abdomen, this can pose a technical issue. Okay. So rectal anastomosis, I think, is a fairly acceptable uh, answer, uh, provided the ureters are okay and uh, short. Uh, it, this won't be a short segment ileal conduit, but uh, is a possibility. Okay, go to the sixth case. Okay, so this patient has presented uh, with uh, lower urinary tract symptoms of frequency, urgency, nocturia, dysuria for four years, bilateral flank pain for one year. He has dry ejaculation and hematospermia. On examination, both the testes and epididymis are hard, enlarged with some areas of the. 
cord being thickened. Hematological investigations create is borderline 1.7, HB is low. I'll show you the uh, CT scan. So the right ureter is dilated with thick walls. Yeah. Thick wall, small capacity bladder. So this is the most uh, common scenario, which is very commonly seen to uh, in your uh, uh, means. Uh, it's commonly seen. Everybody of you must have seen it in your institution that one side is non-functioning, the oppo opposite side ureter has a stricture and bladder is. Small, a small capacity, small capacity. so we won't spend time on this left nephrectomy would be the case okay so now this case patient is interesting case number seven is a 45 year old male who had pulmonary symptoms and was diagnosed to have mdr tuberculosis pulmonary tuberculosis and uh, he presented with flank pain, fever, dysuria, which was managed by digestenting and culture started according to culture sensitivity. Then this same patient, so he started on MDR tuberculosis treatment and he has left flank pain. So then he had right-sided emphysematous pyelonephritis. Right side PCN insertion and perinephric collection for which pigtail was done. That time creatinine was 3.2. He had left sided orchitis, funiculitis, right, right eye vitrectomy also. So he has undergone a lot of problems. So here it was, as I told you initially, unless. Uh, Empty uh, means resistance is detected on microbiology, then only we are able to start uh, treatment for M tuberculosis. So, this is the treatment which is undergone, is go, he is still undergoing for the last two years. So, I'd like to ask you when a patient has MDR tuberculosis, what is and now we are telling you that he has some bilateral renal involvement. What would be the frequency of testing this? Now, he has pulmonary tuberculosis, which is MDR. He has evidence of bilateral genitourinary tuberculosis. He is already on uh, M, uh, this, uh, the schedule for uh, MDR tuberculosis. What would be the frequency of examination of the sputum for response? Uh, six weeks, ma'am. Uh... One, uh, one month, two months, four months. Don't guess it. You know you tell the answer. Hmm. What is the schedule as per the government? If it is MDR, what do you think? Uh, they have they have advised him treatment for two years, right? But they need to know na, in between whether the patient is responding to their treatment, whether the MDR phase is now there, not there, what's happening. So what is the time interval when the sputum has to be retested for resistance? Otherwise, then he'll go for XDR treatment, right? Yes. This question, I'll leave it to you. Read something. So this is his treatment which is receiving. Oh, you can see a big list. Clofamazin, cyclosurine, linonizid, ethambutol, pass, pyridoxin, MV, cal. MVBC, cal. So initially he had symptoms on the left side, then he had symptoms on the right side. This is his CT scan. This is his first CT scan. Huh? You can see that the right kidney is normal. The left kidney shows gross destruction. 
air pockets with air pockets yeah So left stenting was done, that then the right kidney was normal. Now this, this can show you that the right kidney is also showing ultra deco texture. It's not very clear. And this is a plain CT which is done. So for benefit of doubt, uh, we just uh, go ahead with the fact that he has left extensive tuberculosis he has MDR tuberculosis. The MCU is showing a mild narrowing, but that is okay. And bladder is? Uh, good capacity with thick, minimal thickened. Bladder is thickened, but capacity thickened. looks normal. Thickened. So the prostate, yes. in whatever cuts are there, look normal. So the kidney which was showing maximum destruction is the better functioning kidney. What will you do? So you need to read MDR tuberculosis. What is the treatment schedule? What are the time when you uh, repeat the uh, microbiology test to find out whether the patient is responding or not responding and uh, for us as a urologist we have a problem is the kidney which was showing a lot of destruction on the first CT scan is actually the better functioning kidney and the right kidney is not very good functioning in comparison to the left. So what should be done? What do you think? Difficult? No, ma'am. Yeah. Because of DTP has some falsies. Yes. So you need to repeat the EC scan yeah. at a regular intervals because right now he's still on his uh, MDR regime. Okay. And we need to be 100% sure because the uh, the function on EC scan and the anatomy which is seen on CT scan do not match. Match. You need to have better imaging of the right kidney, so you can plan a cystoscopy and RGP in this That's setup, it. because we need uh, the CT has not shown us. It has shown us that the renal parenchyma is showing areas of sure. destruction, but it has no abscess cavities or anything. We need to know the anatomy of the PC system on both the sides. Hmm? And cystoscopy yes. is possible because capacity of the bladder is quite good okay. here. Okay. Hmm? Unless you get these answers, you should not. Uh, I mean, you should not commit and say that we go ahead with right nephrectomy. So many times, purposely cases are told, or purposely some finding is changed to uh, see whether you are thinking rationally, whether uh, or you are an uh, impulsive surgeon. So now here there is some controversy between both the things, so we should be careful about it. So uh, this is there, sir. Do we have time or are we supposed to? We are at the end of time. Uh, one last case will take, there we'll wind up. This case will take last. Time. Okay. So this case I have taken only with an intention to tell you that this is a patient uh, who is a recipient for renal transplant. She was she is a known case of CKD on maintenance hemodialysis and uh, she has no urine output. Her renal biopsy showed that she had uh, some medical renal disease, but she had history of disseminated lymph node tuberculosis. And that's why we asked for a CT scan to see whether there is any renal involvement. And this is the CT scan. Can you see? 
Yes, and not describe. Yeah. Hmm. Describe. This and this film you describe. And right side. Right side is thin. Thin cortex with yes, a shrunken kidney with uh, no parent camera, uh, hardly any parent. No parent, 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 parent some calcification noted in what the is the lesion on the left side? What is this lesion? Calcified cyst. Okay. Yeah, it could be a calcified cyst. Cipher. What is other diagnosis? Uh, chronic abscess. Okay. What else? Uh, tuberculoma. Okay. What else? Combination of end stage renal disease and tuberculosis. Uh, so it uh, could be renal, renal mass. It could be a renal mass and it mass. could be amyloidosis. Okay. Oh, yes. So yes. whenever you see patients who have renal masses in a end stage renal disease, combination of both the diseases together uh, can be a, this could be a case of amyloidosis. And obviously because she's end stage renal disease, treatment will be nephrectomy, see the biopsy and then decide what to do. Okay. So this part, uh, uh, we, uh, I'll omit. Uh, she only I will show you the operative uh, picture. It's there in our book also. So this was a patient who had gross involvement of the bladder. So you can see how the bladders are uh, totally involved in tuberculosis. And this was a VVF. It's a large VVF, no bladder to reconstruct. She had also tubercles in her uh, ileum mesentery. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a cystectomy with an ileal conduit. And uh, coming back to this last possibility, which Chawla sir had asked me to cover, is uh, you need to know that when the clinical symptoms are present, when microbiology is positive and radiology is suggestive, we have no doubt. We can start AKT and then take a call on the surgical management. The possibility two is Clinically, you have to diagnose tuberculosis. So what are the clinical symptoms which make us diagnose tuberculosis is chronicity of the disease, not responding to routine antibiotics, repeated infections, and other constitutional symptoms, plus history of pulmonary tuberculosis or other any, any other organ tuberculosis or contact with uh, MDR or XDR. So here in this scenario, the symptoms are there. Microbiology is positive, but radiology is not showing due to process. So this scenario is very unlikely. Unless you have uh, uh, caught a patient of miliary tuberculosis, but here also you need to start AKT. Now the third possibility is clinical symptoms are present. Microbiology is negative. And radiology is also negative. So this also scenario is very unlikely. And here you have to say that though your clinical uh, uh, suspicion is there, you have to repeat microbiology and radiology at a period of two or three months to confirm your diagnosis. Just on the basis of clinical symptoms, you can't start AKT, which was a common practice when we were students. Now the fourth possibility is there, are no, there is no clinical suspicion of tuberculosis. There are no re radiological features are also not suggestive of tuberculosis. But the patient comes with a report which is positive for tuberculosis. It is, he has a positive AFD report uh, either from smear, culture, or wherever. So here you need to check the lab from which investigations are done. And the MPT-64 antigen test which can be done at little bigger labs, can tell us whether this patient really has tuberculosis. The possibility that only radiology is showing uh, that your radiology that uh, makes you suspect tuberculosis, but the patient doesn't have any symptoms, microbiology is negative. Here, again, 
you have to prove and disprove tuberculosis on microbiology and microbiology you have to get better samples direct aspirations biopsies and repeat the microbiology till you get a diagnosis of tuberculosis another uh, one slide which i wanted to show that these are the common uh, whenever you get a patient of geo tuberculosis and renal failure the reason why renal failure occurs in geo tuberculosis is due to obstruction destruction of the parenchyma and arthritis and amyloidosis this we already discussed <laughs> Okay, so I think uh, completed all the slides. Uh, I just shot one uh, one patient, but I think uh, we did discuss a lot of scenarios, and I hope uh, you could uh, uh, learn something. So, sir, uh, uh, we are yeah, over with our presentations, and thank you very much, sir. Yeah, ma'am. Just uh, one or two questions from the chat box. I think it okay. came at the. When you were giving closing remarks, uh, um, this is regarding how much urine sample to be sent for culture. Uh, is this for AFP culture and uh, for AFP staining? Sir, uh, for uh, AFP staining, uh, the early morning on uh, early voided uh, morning sample is the best sample to color to uh, do it for AFP smear and staining. And if the patient has polyuria and he is uh, getting up to void uh, every 10 minutes, 15 minutes, which is could be a scenario uh, in tuberculosis where we need to collect all the 24 hour samples. Okay, let me see anything else is there in the checkbox. Uh, I think the majority of the comments uh, because everybody was. Uh, uh, quite excited to see the variety of uh, uh, unit tuberculosis. Uh, the radiology was so brilliant, and everybody was giving their suggestion regarding the finding as well as the treatment also. And um, yeah, man, that's all from uh, here chat box. And I think it's the time to close the session. And uh, thank you very, thank you very much, madam. I think you have nicely covered. Uh, uh, many, many things about uh, this urinary tuberculosis, uh, gentle urinary tuberculosis. You did cover the uh, microbiology. You have covered um, the ABCN. You have covered the uh, CBNAT. Uh, you have covered the majority of the urinary with the showing of uh, so many case scenarios of different, different uh, uh, IVU and CT findings. Um, but uh, very importantly, which uh, the candidates usually miss is uh, the category one and category two drugs, and which they should be knowing uh, the mechanism of action. Sir, I would like to. Say. I am Dr. Sridhar. Can I say something? Yeah, just one minute. Just one minute. Let okay. Me okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and uh, overall, a very, very useful session. Um, and, uh, not only on the, on the subject, but if you see the diverse uh, uh, presentation which the unit of purposes can have. Uh, I am rem reminded of uh, Dr. Shishiran's course, this microbacterium tuberculosis uh, is such an nasty organism which can cause infection right from the head to the foot, right from meninges of brain uh, to the vessels of uh, uh, the, uh, the peripheries. So they accept pregnancy, it can cause anything. That was his quote. So the, the, the similar way we have seen a very uh, extensive and comprehensive coverage of the subject, uh, especially the, the the type of imaging which Madam have uh, uh, kept, uh, the RGU, the IVU, the CT, so brilliant. I think it, it was uh, revisiting uh, any textbook um, on the subject. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Regents. And I just, um, you can just uh, unmute yourself and say what you want to say. Good evening, Madam. Uh, good evening, Chavala, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Excellent presentation. We have very rarely seen this much variety in a single session. And I want to ask Madam one thing. See, we are trying to confirm the diagnosis by microbiological means. But if it is not positive, but still your uh, suspicion is strong, how many percentage of cases that you have started ATT without the evidence of uh, microbiology? Because that's what we were doing for quite some time. When I was a student, this was a common scenario that uh, the 
actually feels that it is tuberculosis and we should start it but yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, we if the if clinical suspicion is very strong and radiological features are suggestive of tuberculosis we can start it even if microbiology is negative but both the things have to be there like radiological and clinical suspicion so uh, all these guidelines which are written by government of india they emphasize on clinical suspicion when your clinical suspicion is strong and you have some radiology to point even if microbiology is negative you can start it with it now only... my question is how many percentage of cases still you do that madam because in the advanced era of a uh, lot of microbiological tests available still we are found uh, at loss that we are unable to confirm microbiologically so is it 30% or 40% of our practice Microbiology turns out negative uh, is maybe 10 to 20 percent, but uh, most of times the suspicion has turned out that we do get a positive microscopy. Uh, I think uh, keeping on seeing these cases has little given an insight that uh, you suspect it little commonly and like, uh, yeah, we keep on uh, and we directly send aspirates most of the time. Or PCNs, we do not uh, rely on urine tests, so that is why also maybe our yield is high. But uh, only clinical suspicion and no radiological evidence and no microbiological evidence nowadays. Uh, uh, at least we don't start it at KEM. So there would be some other evidence in addition to clinical. So radiological but, evidence would be there, and then only we start a KTP, even if microbiology is negative. Subsequently, we do get some evidence that microbiology is Ma'am, uh, is it true that at least 300 ml of urine is necessary to do a test to confirm? Is it the minimum volume that you have to that get from? Urine smear. Smear, yeah, that's what I'm. Is it a minimum volume or even less than less than that? Finally, we sent this volume, but it is centrifuged and then uh, under the cover slip uh, or stand, 1.1 ml is always examined. Uh, the total volume, what is voided? That's generally written in the textbooks. Voided uh, uh, early morning sample, round about 300 ml, but uh, whatever is examined is the centrifuged uh, sample. So you are right that 300 ml is the average volume. Unless uh, our patients have bladder involvement and they're voiding 10, 20 ml every 5, 10 minutes, then you can collect the entire 24 hour sample and uh, send it. With Thank you, ma'am. Preservatives and these preservatives would again interfere with the. But I think a little bit of our emphasis on doing urine AFB smear, I do not know if I'm right or wrong. And it's not a point of discussion for the school because they have to men uh, mention smear. But as a, uh, as a teacher, I feel that it has become a less useful investigation. So we are routinely doing it. The yield is maybe one in one in ten twenty patients uh, get positive to. So very less yield of smear. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And uh, good night. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, one and everyone. Thanks for that. Thank you, lovely. Thank, thank you, Kiran, for uh, providing the support. Thank you, ma'am. So, once again, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.